Welcome everyone to Brookline Booksmith's author event series. My name is Silas Weiner and I'm a member of the events team here at Brookline Booksmith. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, allow me to extend a warm virtual welcome. We're so excited that you're all here this evening for our virtual launch event with authors Courtney Summers and Sarah Farazan. You know where to put questions and we'll answer those at the end of the hour. Sarah Farazan is an award-winning and critically acclaimed author of books and stories for young people. Her young adult novels with Anglican young readers are here to stay, tell me again how our crush should feel, and the Lombada Literary Award winning, If You Could Be Mine, <laughs> which was named one of Time's 100 Best YA Books of All Time. Yes. All time. Her all latest time. novel, Dead Flip, is a horror comedy set in the 90s about a childhood friend who comes back from disappearing in the 80s and is still 12 while his estranged best friends are seniors in high school. She also had a dream come true in writing a middle grade graphic novel for DC Comics, My Buddy Killer Croc, illustrated by Nicoletta, <laughs> featuring many of Farazan's favorite characters from Gotham City. And also Sarah lives right here in Massachusetts so we're lucky to have her around the store doing fabulous events all year round. Welcome, Sarah. Happy to do it, Silas. Thank Thanks, you. Brookline Booksmith. <laughs> Courtney Summers is the best-selling and critically acclaimed author of several novels for young adults, including Cracked Up To Be, All The Rage, and Sadie. Her work has been released to multiple starved views, including the Edgar Award and Odyssey Award, and has been recognized by many library best of and reader choice lists. In her latest work, I'm the Girl, all 16 Georgia Avis, all 16-year-old Georgia Avis wants is everything. But the poverty and hardship that defines her life has kept her from the beautiful and special things she knows she deserves. When she stumbles upon the dead body of a 13-year-old Ashley James, Georgia teams up with Ashley's older sister Nora to find the killer before he strikes again. And their investigation throws Georgia into a glittering world of unimaginable wealth and privilege, and it's all she's ever dreamed of. But behind every dream lurks a nightmare, and Georgia must reconcile her heart's desires with what it really takes to survive. As Ashley's killer closes in and their feelings for one another grow, Georgia and Nora must discover what money, power, and beauty, that when money, power, and beauty rule, it's not always a matter of who is guilty and who is guiltiest. But only that, the th but that the only thing that might save them is each other. And I'll add that when I was researching for this event, I really enjoyed reading Courtney's recent interview in Go Magazine, oh, where she you. talked candidly <laughs> about balancing genuine pride in one's sexuality as a queer author with the pressure to disclose from the publishing industry. It's really interesting. You can find it linked on our socials. Highly recommend it. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our authors, Sarah and Courtney. That's yeah. such a great day. Thank you, Silas. Yes, that's awesome. That I want to like very, very nice. I'm taking that recording everywhere. <laughs> I'm just gonna play it <laughs> instead of introducing myself. You can because it's on YouTube. That's so true. You can just you know. Hi, that's Courtney. Hi. Hi. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone who's here. Yes. Thanks hello to the coming. chat. Yeah, please it's chat amongst out, yourselves. Ready. Be cool. You can compliment Courtney throughout. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Oh, can and I? Can I say I saw um, Mando is here, and it's his birthday tonight. So can we say happy birthday, happy Mando? Happy birthday, Mando! Happy birthday, Mando! Happy birthday! That's He's great. like he believes Sadie is alive more than anyone. I think so. I just have well, to that. I imagine a lot of people do, right? Or I don't I know. Guess. I can't. Mm -hmm. Is she? I don't know. I can't tell okay. you that. Go to my grave with me. Okay. Well, if you think about telling us, <laughs> you have an hour. But it's we wanted YouTube. to welcome everybody. Um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q and A area, and we will, you know, at seven forty-five ish, uh, take questions. So that'll be sweet. Um, Courtney, thanks for having me do this with you, and congrats Thank on another you. stunning book. That is, um, that is killing me. I love that the poster behind your head is just so it completely. I'm gonna leave it here for the rest of my life. Okay. So, 
when I zoom or something, they'll be like, it's did she write there. that book? Be like, no, it, but like, I like didn't. If you, but the best part is it's like literally looking over your shoulder. It's very yeah. ominous looking. Yeah. I'm thrilled you're doing this with me. I when we were talking about doing a book line event, I'm like Sarah. It's got to be Sarah. Oh, thank you. Sarah. So I'm I'm you. I'm honored because you're such a superstar and and your books are really amazing and really gut punching and um, although these two they have some things in common, but not everything. There's no. there's a bit of a difference in genre and tone and age and you all kinds of stuff. Like a possessed pinball machine in yours, and I cut the possessed pinball machine out of mine. Yeah, I mean yeah. we couldn't have two at the same time. I will no. say it did remind me of one of my favorite songs. Um, so to quote Paula Abdul and DJ Scat Cat, um, we come together because opposites attract. So um, you know. I'm I'm thrilled to be here and talking. It's a to beautiful you about this thing. It is a beautiful <laughs> thing. So why don't we get into it? Silas sort of uh, mentioned the plots of our books, but if you want to give a quick kind of pitch to the grand people that are here, if they just stumbled upon an event and were like, "What are these <laughs> books about?" Let's give I a quick just stumble little... upon a, a virtual event. You I might be like, might. "Oh, I, you know, that looks nice. I'll register for that." You know. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then my quick pitch is two girls team up to find a killer and, and fall for each other little feel good book of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are there are good feelings. There are also a lot of dark feelings, but I like yeah. that pitch. Um, mine is 80s, 90s horror comedy um, about literally outgrowing a friendship. So the one literally. friend who was trapped in a pinball machine in 1987 comes back still age 12, the age he went missing in 1992 and his two friends who are now seniors in high school and don't hang out with each other anymore. Um, they have to get back together to and reconcile their friendship while also babysitting their 12 year old friend, friend who might be weird now that he's out from the machine and might be up to That's some a little uh, weird, might be up to some nefarious stuff. He's got uh, a, a very big jaw issue. Yeah, we're not going to spoil anything. No, you know, we're going to keep it I'll as spoil spoiler free as possible. Thank you. Both books are excellent. That's true. Um, they're Quality available through the Brookline Booksmith. So yes. you know, I'm sure there's a link in there if you want to. And we'll sign it, you know, we'll personal. I mean, we'll just be like, hey, <laughs> we've signed this. You know, that so, market value. I mean, for you, sure. I think for Courtney, it'll be like, oh, pretty penny. For me, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe like, uh, it's like getting a coupon in a newspaper. You're like, all right, yeah, feeling good about it. <laughs> I mean, I like, okay, so I thought when I was reading Dead Flip, I was because we're doing this event together, I'm like, we've got to find a way to merge these these topics because it, it might be helpful. And I got to this part in the book where Corey's like, oh, I got to do everything that men want me to do. I hate it, but I don't like it. It's just like it, she's constantly like grappling with the patriarchy, right? Yes. And how she can, if she can conform to it and whether or not she can live inside those lines. And I was like, oh, that's it. Because that's exactly yeah. what's going on. And I'm the girl to a, a much darker extent. But I yes. mean, yeah, you show like a possessed pinfall down one path of the patriarchy and mine is like a really grim resort. The point is it's bad. And we have that in common in our books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And um, we're both ridiculously good looking. So we have that, that going too. for us. Um, I thought I'd start the conversation, if that's okay with you. Um, and hopefully you can hear me, see me, and I don't freeze up. If I do, just right. keep it going. Okay. Um, but I thought we'd start with, um, I've always wondered in your work, because you do do these books that are very timely, but also timeless. Um, and you have these characters that are so strong and are so like, feel like real people and also going through really difficult stuff. And I wondered if you start with the voice of a character first, or is there a news event or something in current events that sparks your wanting to tell a story? I I just answered, uh, like I answered this question in Kirkus recently and I, I couldn't put it better than I did there, which is I think I'm like led by anger, you know? So when I see something that pisses me off, eventually a book gets built around it and the whole Epstein case like really pissed me off because mm -hmm. that man was so untouchable for so long and his victims weren't quiet about 
the atrocities he'd committed against them. And it was, it was literally a case of a bunch of people looking at a bunch of girls crying out for help and going, I can't hear you. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I can't see you. And, and it was just so frustrating. And, and then the, the machinations and the manipulations, everything that it took to make that work. It was like, they basically built this empire on girls' bodies. It was so mm -hmm. infuriating. So, you know, I was like, how can I channel that anger into a suspended state of anger where I'm just constantly angry and writing all the time? <laughs> and I'm the girl I was born. <laughs> but in that, you know, because, and I think that's wonderful, and I've certainly written stuff to make myself feel better or process things. But when you are writing something that is touching upon such dark subject matter for a long period of time, um, how do you balance that out with like getting out of the story when you want to have dinner or like you know need alone time um like balance. how do you balance that yeah what is that i simply do not sarah i do not None? balance it out no i'm just a low level simmer all the time okay it's like the <laughs> hulk like i'm always angry yes that's the most relatable thing i've ever heard in a, a, Mar in a marvel movie see i didn't yeah. even know if it was marvel that's how out of touch i am that's okay you're great but we're yeah. talking to dc right like, yeah, DC is fine. They're yeah, DC. Yeah, is okay. but um, that man's good. Yeah, but I just, I mean, there must be, yes, like, but are there times where it is just too much that you're kind of like, is there a go-to playlist you have, or is there like a? You're gonna think this is so weird because it's not really a. I just I play Alien Isolation. It's a video game set oh. in the Alien. It's in the Alien universe, and basically you are Ellen Ripley's daughter, and you're on a space station, and you have to survive the alien. And little by little, everything gets stripped away from you until you're 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 determined to survive, but you're no longer afraid of death because you're like okay. <laughs> being chased by an alien all the time. It soothes me. Okay, so that would make me like really anxious, but that's. Well, you have to look at it like if you were on a spaceship mm -hmm. and there was an alien on a spaceship yeah. um, and you needed to survive, like everything else you're worried about just goes away. You just have that one immediate problem. Who cares about taxes? Who cares about the book you're writing? You just have to survive the moment. I guess. I think for me, it's like I am such a scaredy cat, which is it was funny writing Dead Flip because I like my editor was like, can you make it scarier? It's not very it has scary. creepy scenes. It's, it's creepy, creepy, but it's scenes. like um, much like space balls, like the part where the alien comes out of the stomach, like then he does a dance. Like that's <laughs> my level of scary. Like, oh, something gross happened and we're, oh, but then he does like the hello, my baby. Hello. My baby. <laughs> that's, that's more my, my uh, jam. So you start with the anger and that fuels the story and then your characters come and. Um, yeah, I think it's, a, yeah, there's always a girl in that like, it's just a matter of fitting her into the situation and deciding how she'll respond to the situation. And, and I, I mean, I think a lot of the times people attribute my work as like pushing the bounds of likability, but what I really want to do is test the limits of other people's empathy. So I guess yeah. when I'm sitting there trying to decide on a character, I'm like, how can I, how can I make you care about a girl? That's basically the question that I'm asking every time I sit down and write a book. It's kind of depressing to ask it over and over again. It's like, okay, will this be the time, please? But I, I've never seen it as unlikable in your stuff. I don't either, I, honestly. I see it as very human. Thank you. you no, know, I think when when these we hear about these terrible events like Epstein's abuses and and um, and any kind of even the Nexium like sex cult, things like that. Right. You hear these things and you're like, oh, how could they be so dumb or how could they right. fall for it? Or how could they end up in that situation? Until you, like, you don't know what you'd do if you were in that situation. And I think you write young people who like, if I found myself in this place, what are the most human reactions I might have? Like, what are the, like, cause not everybody does save the day and not everybody does like, no. especially when you have the weight of all this power and money and privilege up against you. Like you're not always gonna, it's not always gonna work out, right? The way you'd like right. it to. So um, I've never understood the unlikable thing, but I also um, don't understand a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. 
I I'm mostly just, hanging out with my Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man piggy bank. So that's like a um, safe place yeah. to be. I don't blame. Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, unlikable. I mean, that's a that's just a buzzword people throw around because they don't want to yeah. do the work of of empathizing or taking the time to yeah. to figure out the reaction that they're having to these young women because it's never yeah. a problem with them. It's always a problem with sure. the women. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine told me once, she was like, they call women with a personality intimidating. And I've always <laughs> held on to that. I like that. Um, That's true. Yeah. I've got tons of personality. I don't know that I'm intimidating. <laughs> My eyebrows, maybe they're. I'm terrified right now. <laughs> oh, well, pitter patter. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. So I guess like in our, both our books and you mentioned earlier, um, the patriarchy informs Georgia and Corey to kind of move through the world in a certain way. Um, you know, Corey feels sort of like she's in middle school and her two childhood best friends are boys right, and that's right. been her whole life. And, um, and she's getting this messaging from her older sister, Tiffany, from society at large, from her parents that like the tomboy days are kind of going to come to an end. Like you have to sort of femme up in a weird way like there it's just yeah. it's a strange and it, it's set in 1987 when that happens so um and she kind of learns what it is to be like a cool girl or like what girls are supposed to be interested in and georgia in your book she embraces them as a means to like her value is based on her girlhood kind of in right. like the society so i guess talking about like I don't know. Ultimately, it's like there's no one way to be a girl and that's all crap. But in the context of our stories, um, I think for both of them, it's like a survival mechanism, like leaning right. into hotness or feminist or being um, an object of desire um, and not. I don't know, like, how did you find balancing that and, and writing that like? Um, yeah. I just want to say what I liked about Corey is you could like really feel an acute sense of grief sort of building up inside her in the early part of the book where she's like, oh, God, you know, I can't get to be who I want to be under these conditions. And so she yeah. just sort of falls into what she thinks she has to do to survive those conditions. And I think with Georgia, she's someone who's so determined to better her circumstance. And all she knows is like a patriarchal, classist, misogynistic environment. So you can either be crushed by those circumstances or you can try to work within them. And I, I mean, in her perspective, that's what she thinks. And she meets the exact wrong woman to be like, yeah, that's what you need to do. Your body yeah. is not just an object, it's a tool. And it's about turning Cleo, who is like a, a mentor to Georgia, not a, a very healthy one, is a woman yeah. who works at this CD resort and is constantly telling Georgia, men have the power your body is the power you have over men and she's it's so weird because writing cleo was like you could see where in this very twisted way she was making sense but everything she was saying was so bad like like mm -hmm. this is exactly the wrong way to approach the problem you know like, yeah but the the solution is get rid of men you know like that's <laughs> never the first thing people think of but it's actually the solution so I don't know. There has to be a happy medium. Anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I just well, gave it to you. No. <laughs> okay. All right. It's your event. So <laughs> you're right, Courtney. Um, so yeah, writing Cleo. So Aspera is the resort that Georgia, the main character, the girl of I'm the girl wants to work at. Um, and it's this resort that caters to the rich and famous. It's very private, very secretive. And she sort of sees this place as like a ticket out of her town and a ticket to something better. Um, so Cleo is the wife of Matthew who like runs the show at Astera. Right. Um, it's safe to say he's an Epstein, Weinstein-like person. He's a bad man. He's not great, but no. he dresses well. Um, <laughs> he does. <laughs> and yeah, and he likes chocolate cake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but otherwise an asshole, Red but face. anyway, yeah, we don't want to <laughs> spoil it, but, um, but Cleo is, is Matthew's wife. Uh, so they both run the show at Aspera. Um, and so 
in writing someone like Cleo, like here's the line where, you know, she's talking to um, Georgia about what you said earlier, like, um, because this world is made by men, beauty is decided by them and power is held only by them. And there's nothing you can do about any of it. Um, so I don't know, that gave me pause because it's like, it's kind of true. Like it's it is, it's true. very, but also like kind of, but she's telling them Georgia, like even a man like this, who's like a really awful guy who's exploited Georgia, um, has more power than you and more power than me. But if the peak of a man's power is only the power he has over you, you know what happens then? And Georgia's like, oh, no. What? And she goes, you gain nothing from it. You get nothing for it, you know? Um, so like, she's basically saying what you said earlier, that like, it's a man's world, but if you're gonna navigate it and you're gonna like, don't let them, like let us have the power, right? Like we right. are an object of desire, that kind of thing, which again, not great messaging, but no. Cleo is someone who. Cleo is <laughs> like, Cleo has been, but Cleo is also. She's been exploited in her own life and she also thinks, yeah. yeah. She's like, yeah, abuse. this is the only right. way that I see out of this. Like I will never have better than what has, Cleo's, uh, I wouldn't, trust i wouldn't introduce my daughter to cleo to say i don't have no. a daughter but if i did you know she's a she's a very i think she's a complicated character she's more complicated i think than the woman that she was based on um she uh she has been exploited in the past and she wants a way out of she she too wanted a way out of her situation you know she had a, a rough upbringing and she was like she looked around and she was and she said this is how i get what i want and she got what she wanted so yeah. You know, like that's, she's grooming. She's also grooming, you know, Georgia. So it's a whole, it's a very slow build, like just seeding these terrible ideas into Georgia's mind. And she weaponizes Georgia's lesbianism against her to do it. So does Matthew, you know, they, they, they act like, you know, because you're a lesbian and you, you don't care what men think, well, this should make it that much easier for you. Yeah. And Georgia's like, yeah, which no, but no. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Like I'm still a person. Still a yeah, human being <laughs> I'm still a person with feelings. I mean, yeah. I don't. You know, it's not their top consideration, but you know, like she's uh, she's espousing the the doctrine of Matthew and Aspera because it has served her well so far. She's gotten everything she's wanted for it, and she thinks she knows what George wants too. Yeah, it's yeah, you know, feel good. Like I said. I want I want to ask like you a question because okay, okay but it, yeah. you can do whatever you want to do it's, yeah you have to it's my event. Yeah. yeah okay well Fair so event. like <laughs> you have I was talking about this with Nina LaCour last night um like you've been writing Queer YA for a while now and I yeah. feel like it's thanks to authors like you and Melinda Lowe and Nina who have really like transformed the conversation and expanded it in terms of your work that, you know, I greatly admire all of your work. I've been watching it for, like, it's been years, like, honestly. It's been 10 years, almost. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and that's, that's a long time to be doing this kind of work, to be doing, being this kind of visible. And like, has, how do you navigate readers' expectations of queer rep? And like, has it changed since you started? And is it like, is it getting more complicated or is it just getting more interesting? Like, how goes it, Sarah? Well, <laughs> I, I can only speak for me. I can't speak for, well, you know, the yeah, general yeah. public. Um, I don't know. I think it's sort of been nice to be like, kind of keep chugging along. Like I, my goal has always just been to keep telling another story or to work, you know, but I'm not always like in high demand. Like there's no like, oh, this one's a bestseller. Like, um, which has been kind of nice. Cause then, I mean, I'd like to, that'd be great one day, but I'm just saying that. that it has been nice to like, and again, like you were saying, Nina, Melinda, and so many others, even in the seventies, like Nancy Garden and Julianne Peterson. And for that matter, Francesca Leah Block, who I think is straight, but wrote queer characters. And so there, there, there have, has been a great tradition of, and Jacqueline Woodson, there has been a great tradition of, you know, queer lady authors who paved the way and um, those books, were wonderful, but maybe not as mainstream or as commercial. 
Um, and certainly my first book, I didn't think it would get published. Um, and now it's getting banned in certain places, which makes me sad for the kids there. But, um, you know, also what helps is I'm really bad at being gay. Um, I haven't dated in a long time. Um, I'm not a great flirt. Um, there are other things I'm good at that I've embraced my lesbianism. Um, but it's also not something that I really think about much, much like my, I mean, I do, but like, I don't like much like being Persian, like I, I am. And there's a lot to explore with that. And, and, but it's also not the first thing I think about when I wake right. up. Um, <laughs> I, I will say like, I, you know, you're getting a lot I of think, solidarity. I think being, I, yeah, <laughs> I think being out from the jump, you know, um, because I, I, the book that I wrote was very queer and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with being queer. So, um, but I don't think that needs to be the way for everybody. I mean, I, I think there is something about writing a book from a certain experience that is true because then it feels real. And because the people reading it are like, oh, I recognize that. I feel so seen. I feel so like, and it should benefit people who are a part of that community, especially when there's a success. You know, like right. when Melinda right. Lowe, when, who's in the chat, by the way, hi, Melinda, hey. who wins <laughs> like a national book award, you know, that's huge, right. right? That's really like a huge boon for all of us. Um, Last year, like it was the Melinda Lowe year and it was awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. And this year too. Yeah. It's, been, it's just Come the on. hits keep on rolling. Yep. She's in her Rocky Three era, like the beginning <laughs> of Rocky Three, where there's a montage of like all the like success and stuff. And we'll watch it together. Don't worry. But yeah. So it's, um, but I'm, I'm saying that I'm so grateful to people who came for And it's so nice to see lots of other authors write queer stories, whether they're out or not. Um, I, I'm not on social media a whole lot. I don't really <laughs> spend a lot of time in YA lit discourse, um, which isn't bad or good. It's just not for me. Um, and I kind of just, uh, you know, I want to be respectful and thoughtful. I think all of us do, you know. Um, I've written straight people. I hope I did okay there you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's just, um, I always think my, my whole thing about all of this, like all the noise and all the, like, you want your book to do well and you want, but mostly I think about the young people reading it. And I know adults read these books and lots of different age groups. I'm not, but I'm always thinking about the kids and if a kid finds it cool or fun or relatable or like, oh, this book was okay, but I finished it. And I feel proud that I finished it. Let me find another book that I like better you know, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I have any advice now that you are um, <laughs> out and about, but um, I mean, I've always been rooting for you, you know, but now I'm just rooting more. <laughs> I love it. Not that, not that that's a reason to, <laughs> to disclose your personal life, but um, you know, very, very happy you're in the club. I it's an too. inclusive club. Everybody can it be is. in the club. I just mean that it's um <laughs> Elizabeth yeah it's just okay. yeah I've always been also been rooting for you. we're all rooting for you everyone in this, in this <laughs> thing sorry but I'm just saying that uh it's been I think you've handled this whole situation with a lot of grace and um thank you and yeah Aww. Nice. do you have any are you used to it yet or you don't we don't have to talk yes. about it <laughs> Uh, everyone's just so happy I'm gay it's so nice yeah. <laughs> we'd be happy if you're not too if you're like you know what I met this nice slightly lady. less happy I I'd be There's you know I'd be okay with it I'm just saying that it's you've handled the whole thing very well and um and I'm sorry that uh see I, I would be people just can't be write 47 percent less happy Susan I would be oh. less happy if I was straight and I okay. I'm personally oh. invested in Susan's Su 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 happiness so <laughs> good to know. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else can we talk about? Um, speaking of lesbianism, um, <laughs> you know, we have, we have, there are lesbians in our books. There are. Yes. Okay. I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. I've heard. Um, so we have that in common. Yes. Um, so the, uh, 
the romance in your book again don't want to give it away to anybody but this georgia no the the Ge georgia the main character um wants to help nora who's very dreamy um find out who killed <laughs> nora's younger sister ashley that's how the book starts there's ashley's body is found by georgia it's very sad it's right um, for romance, every, every romance. I mean, I didn't see it head. coming because, you know, it starts with like a murder, but, but right. you know, life's right. so short, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> okay. kiss when you can. Um, but <laughs> like, so Nora, so Georgia wants to help Nora find out who killed Ashley, but also she's so taken in by Aspera and Matthew and Cleo and everything that it can offer um, that her loyalties are sometimes divided or seem that way. Right. Um, so you're not really sure which way George is going to go. Um, so I just want to talk about like how you were able to be like, okay, I have this unreliable narrator in a way and people deciding if she's going to actually help Nora, who she likes a lot and has a serious romantic attachment to, right. or she's going to, you know, just choose a spara. Um, and I guess, how did you, did you think it would end the way that you thought it would? Or was okay. <laughs> she going to be so taken in that? Well, I mean, George you know. is um, like, because part of a appeal is Cleo and Cleo is like a thirst object for George. Like every time George looks at Cleo, she's like, oh, her legs, you know, like they're such nice legs. <laughs> I, I want to be around those legs. But Nora is the girl she's been harboring a crush on for a long time. And every time, my favorite thing about the way she sees Nora is Nora's been through such trauma. And every time George sees her, she's like, oh, she's looking worse. That's so hot. Like every time she sees it, it's like that's true love. OK, so but honestly, though, Nora is really a, she serves as a contrast to what's going on in Aspera. She's there to provide a healthy and safe and loving environment for George to explore her sexuality and to be with someone who doesn't just see her as an object. Whereas when George is in Aspera, she's being exploited for her queerness. She's being exploited for her body and she's being convinced that she's being empowered by that. So it's always like a juxtaposition between them. And I always like knew it was, of course it was Nora. It had to be Nora. I'm not that okay. evil. Like, <laughs> just... I don't know, like maybe, you know, when you, write stuff you don't know how it's always going to turn out like you have an idea but it changes and I don't know if she would totally be enveloped by the dark side I don't know oh you just did a great job of as usual it's, good oh, job writing you. a thriller where you don't know <laughs> which way it's gonna go um let me see so there is a connection to Sadie and I'm the girl yeah um a minor one do you want to tell people what it is or they should just read it and figure it out? And It's Sadie got made into an Oscar award winning movie like she's eventually going to, <laughs> you know, it's uh, there's a, there was a we did a prequel short story or no epilogue. I keep saying prequel because it's a prequel to I'm the girl kind of, but it's mm -hmm. and um, it connects Sadie to. I'm the girl and I, I like the idea of like Sadie is a book about a man who exploits well, it's partly a book about a man who exploits a young woman's story so that he can have a hip podcast. And um, it's sort of the progression of where that goes. It's it's an extension of the conversations that kind of started with Sadie. So when I say it's a spiritual successor, I don't want people thinking that Sadie's going to be like, hey, I was alive the whole time, yeah. yo. <laughs> I'm going to take it down a resort now. But it's very much, I feel like her, I don't want to say ghost, lest I upset people, her energy. Her energy is there. It's hovering around. Yeah. No. And that it's referenced in the book is fun for, I think, yeah. for people to be like, oh. She's looking for a pinball machine to possess. She is not <laughs> looking for a pinball machine. That's My fine. event and everything I say is right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Like, um, Why would Sadie have a ghost? She's alive and married. Okay, Heather. Yeah. I'll you have it. <laughs> See, your friends pay attention. Um. Any research you did for your work that you were surprised by? Not just something that you were like, I never or thought I'd be by. researching this. No, just like, you know, like in the book, there are a lot of antlers. 
at That's Aspera. True. There's a lot of antlers on the, you know, Matthew really enjoys a hunt, which creeps me out. Um, <laughs> were there any things that you were researching that you're like, I can't believe I've really. Okay, the, this is not, there's so much terrible things that I researched that I wouldn't, it wouldn't be polite to talk about, but yeah. um, developing the resort was a whole ordeal. And um, it was kind of, I, it, it was not based on, I don't want to say it was based on any resort because that sounds uh, like it would get me in trouble. Like, oh, you're the bad resort that you, I based my bad resort on. But there's this place called Primland in Virginia, and it's like a big resort in the middle of the wilderness. And and I guess I stole, I someone told me that they import birds for people to hunt there. And if you don't kill the bird, the bird flies off and dies because it, it can't survive its natural habitat. So I stole that and put it in. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What about you? You have like all these like cultural nineties, eighties references, like you're already hip on that stuff. But. Yeah. I think I just wanted to write a book that put all that information to use. Um, because for fun, I just really enjoy <laughs> researching the eighties and nineties. Like, um, it was your time I had to a shine. customer. Yeah. I had a customer service job where like one monitor I'd be doing work, but like the other, I would just have like 80s commercials on YouTube or 90s commercials or like Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade from 1986 or like just anything of like it was just all bubbling in me it's okay, just things so I enjoy is there like a pop a pop culture reference that you're super proud of in Dead Flip well I'm sad that I my publisher asked me to write like a glossary so kids today would be like I don't know what this is like can you, I haven't I haven't you didn't have to yet. come in here and sniper us all Sarah God no, I haven't finished it yet I don't know that I will don't do it but no. um but I you know there's a dog in dead flip that um is called potato chip and um is named potato chip because um Tiffany Corey's older sister was like oh he looks like a like a low rent popple and popples were popples. Um, I had a popple. You did? Yes. I had one. I lost it, but well, I'm really tragic. upset about it. Yeah. I think I've just been collecting a lot of things from childhood that I lost or that I always wanted and didn't have. Like I got this gremlins lunchbox. Oh my um, God. I don't know if you can see it up there. Um, okay. And it has some kid's name in it from the eighties, but like, it's not my, it's not. I my hope it's not a possessed box. gremlins lunchbox. Well, I thought about calling the number inside the gremlins lunchbox once. And then I was like, that's going to be too weird. And like, don't do it. I'm not going to do it. Do that's going to start it. another horror story that I'm not ready for. Um, do but it. no, I guess I just wanted to like have fun, you know, What's I feel that like, like writing for fun. I mean, it was still work. It was still no. Hard. I know it's still work, but writing fun things like what's that? Yeah, like? um, it's a lot more joyful. It's I guess to your question earlier about what's it like having been out this whole time and writing sort of books that speak to that. Um, I think my first three novels and a lot of my short stories have been very identity based or things that I want to get off my chest or things that, and of course, like it's not going to be. You know, it is going to be messy because it's one point of view. And I was younger when I wrote that stuff. And it's just stuff I've wanted to get on my chest, off my chest or examine or think about. And um, and this time it was more like writing stuff I enjoy, but also that idea of like, what is it to lose your childhood friends? You know, like just thinking about like, you know, you have friends in different phases of life. And now right. I'm in the phase where people are getting married and they're starting their own families. And I like, I'm like, I'd rather watch TV. That seems scary. So I think writing <laughs> about that and writing about um, nostalgia in that it can be fun and it can be great and it can be really like bittersweet, but it also can be really deceptive. Like yes. you might look back on something and be like, oh, didn't we have a fun time? And someone else be like, actually, I had a, I had a really hard time. That was not a good time for me. Worst time. Of my um, life. Yeah, and how we can kind of make the past seem glowier and fuzzier than it actually was. Um, yeah. So it's it wasn't all fun and games, but it was definitely nice to have characters that share aspects of my identity 
going on adventure that isn't necessarily like talking about prejudice or isms. I mean, it's in there, but it isn't right. like the the main attraction. Focus. The pinball machine that eats people is the main attraction. You know? And what a pinball machine. What a pinball machine. We yeah. love it. <laughs> Oh, Silas is back. Silas, I imagine. What did we do? What did Sarah time do? Q and A. Yes, it's time okay. for Q and A. Ask questions, um, you guys. Yeah, yeah. So, pulling from the Q and A chat box, uh, the first question is from Emma. Romy, from your book *All the Rage*, her color is red. What is Sadie and George's colors? Oh. You know what the worst thing is? It keeps being red because Sadie had the red hoodie on the cover. I got that cover. There was no red hoodie in the book until I got the cover. And then I put the red hoodie in. And, and Georgia, she, she wears, I think, a yellow dress. It could be yellow, but she also, like, obsesses over Cleo's red lipstick. So I have something going on there. I don't know if it's a cry for help or something, but there's something thematically. There's a through line with red in my books. I don't know why. That's a good, question. good color. It's a strong color. Rage, it passion. You know. Rage, rage, yes. <laughs> Slow simmering rage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Megan asks Courtney. Did, did, you, did everyone see her Jason Priestley? <laughs> Listen, I wanted Courtney to feel at home. You have a fellow Canadian with you. And so um, I've said this before in other Zooms, really even though I'm very, I'm very gay and have been for a long time. Um, this guy, you know, he makes me question stuff, <laughs> you know, so he's a very pretty man. So. so pretty. Those eyebrows. So I'm just saying that if you're a young person who's questioning, you don't have to have all the answers because me and Jason Priestley still, I'm still very gay. I'm just saying there's just saying there's always some, I don't know. Anyway, that's not part of the colors question <laughs> that Emma wanted answered. But. It's just a new level of all of us getting to know each other. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question. Mando asks, do you feel like Sadie was queer? I've heard theories she is ace. Oh. She was, I, I mean, I, her in the book, Sadie says, um, anyone who listens to me, I love them a little, which is so sad. But I, I think of Sadie as like, but like this is how I interpret her. I wouldn't want to take that interpretation interpretation away from an ace reader, but I think of I think she's bi. And yeah, but I think she'd like probably end up with a woman. Definitely end up with a woman. But I just envision it. I always like thought if I returned to Sadie, there'd be something with cat, but I don't know. A cat? <laughs> no, there was this girl named Cat oh, oh. and she sat on the road. <laughs> so, I was like, and then she had a sweet really little gay. kiss. They adopted yeah. a cat together. And that yeah. was the, you know. Yeah. Heather is trying to start a fight in the chat with me. Oh, let's I see. Is there a fight. way, Silas, that these comments can be, oh, sorry. Immortalized and printed. <laughs> is there a way, Silas, that these comments can be printed for Courtney? So, you know. No, that just, she can so I can them. be tortured by everyone who insists that <laughs> the author is dead so Sadie can live. <laughs> There you go. No, they're very nice things in here. Yeah, there are. Yeah. No, I just, you know, <laughs> it'll, it'll be nice <laughs> for you to read these. <laughs> All right. Another question is from Jennifer for Courtney. Do you think you will write horror again? And maybe, Sarah, you can jump in since this is, you like to do some creepy things in your new book. Sarah's doing yeah. the horror for both of us, I think. I, I mean, I'm writing horror on a very specific level. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm the girl is, is a horror book, you know, in a way that it, because it's so real. Right. You know I mean, there isn't something supernatural. It's like, these are really terrifying things that um, are happening. Um, so I don't, I, it is a horror in a way. It's just right. more. But are we going like to get more pinball machines is what I want to know. Oh, gosh. Well, I'd love to. I think it's been a lot of fun to write this genre. And um, and I don't know, I've written romantic books before, but sometimes I feel like I'm a little dead inside, so I don't know if I can keep doing it. Um, so this has been really fun. I think all the books will be funny. You know, I have a sports book. 
I have a, so all of them, humor seems to be the thing that I lean into, which sometimes I need to do less of because not everything can be funny. Um, but I'd, I'd like to write horror stuff again, but in a, in a, uh, in a good time way. Like in a good time comedy. Way. Yeah. That could be your tagline, horror yeah. in a good time way. Yeah. Like you'll get scared a little bit. And also I feel like it's a, a, for kids that have, and it's for everybody again, but I think also a lot of 30 somethings who grew up in this time will recognize how very early nineties it is. Um, it is so dead flip is like, it's, it's like, it reminds me of, are you afraid of the dark and goosebumps yes. and like, and it's got that Stephen King kind of coming of age element that, yeah. yeah. Like when he was doing the body and stuff like that, I just love yeah. it. It's good. Which is what I was going for. Like, I love the show called Eerie Indiana. When that I was, was so good. Yeah. 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 And that was, like the showrunner of that show was Joe Dante, who directed Gremlins. Which, um, so it all, amazing. yeah, basically I'm just trying to do Joe Dante stuff. Um, <laughs> but I know, I think, yeah, I think Courtney, you can really write whatever you want to write. You're really talented. Um, and um, I hope that There's you- There's no shortage of talent here. Well, yeah, but like, <laughs> you know, of your poster <laughs> up. So, <sighs> Silas, yeah, is there any way to print out these comments for Courtney so she can Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't need it. Like, my ego is big enough. Let's I can, I'll i take screenshots. I think, I think there may be. I If if Zoom decides to bless me with a uh, both uh, video, audio, and text trifecta, which it normally does, then okay. we have a record. Okay. Uh, we've got another question for both. What was the most challenging thing about writing these books? Jeez. Gosh, I think writing in the pandemic was not always easy. I had a tough time reading for sure. Like focus was not always there. I was very grateful to have a project and to have an escape hatch and something to come to, but um, that was tough. Um, I had to really kill a lot of darlings. There was a whole ass grandfather in the first draft <laughs> of Dead Flip, um, who was very that. sweet, charming man. Um, and he he is not in, in Dead Flip at all. So <laughs> that was really hard. I'd written this character that I thought was really sweet and wonderful and funny. Um, and he wasn't necessary. He was taking focus away from the big three, the main three kids. And then all their friends, you know, he was taking up a lot of space um, and not moving the plot along. Bye, um, grandpa. <laughs> yeah, by grand, RIP grandpa. So, um, so that was tough. And I think figuring out, like, again, you, I had a roadmap and I had an outline and I knew what I wanted it to be, but it changed a lot from from first draft to what it is now. Um, and and age makes you let go a lot easier. And you're like, fine, whatever, it's cool. But I think just like going on a lot of walks and figuring out, okay, how are you going to make it work? I think that, that was tough, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, I think it would be just knowing that Giorgio was a character that was going to really push against people's uh, comfort levels and that they do everything they could to blame her for everything that happened to her. And I write these books so that like young women can feel heard and, and seen and and feel validated by their experiences reading them without feeling like moralized or condescended to or like i'm using them as a platform to show everyone how smart i am but when you do something like that you also know that you're going to find exactly the kind of readers that you're writing against and then it's like at what point does my book become a source of empowerment for a young woman and a platform for someone else's misogyny and i I think they're very purposeful and I think they need to be written, but I, I hate when it, they fall into the exact wrong people's hands and they just go to town. Not it, like, not even because they don't like my books, but because they hate women. It's like, ah, oh, great. We get to hear that. You know, it's like, ugh, I don't like it. I didn't even think about the audience. <laughs> Man, you want to go down that rabbit hole? <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah, that, I'm trying to think of like an upbeat way we can end. <laughs> well, but. yeah, I, I, there's a, there's a comment in the chat that's a big gay hug. 
I think that's <laughs> nice. That is nice. I think that that's very right. That's the very right. But I mean, I, I also Bro- don't want to. Yeah. Find books now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well. There's a link for the book. Yeah. You know, they sponsored us. They hosted us. You're they all here. Great. You know, if they you already have life. a copy, maybe get one for a friend. Right. Um, so I if, just... if it's not in your budget right now, ask for it at your library. Um, and support the Brookline Booksmith all the time when you can. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and they... I just dropped the Eventbrite link in the chat. And remember oh, that amazing. Um, Sarah will be signing the books uh, yep. in store on Friday. And um, there are signed book plates for Courtney, as well as an indie exclusive pink print it's edition. So, pretty. Um, so definitely uh, buy through the Eventbrite page tonight if you want access to those things. But thank you so much to both sure. of you. Thank you, yeah. Tyler. Courtney, is there anything else you wanted to tell the people who came out here to support you tonight? And I am very grateful for their attendance. I'm grateful to Bookline Booksmith, and I'm grateful to you, Sarah. I love doing this launch with you all this week. I can't believe my book's out, but it is. And I got to punctuate this experience with a bunch of cool people in one place, and I didn't even have to leave my house, which is even better. Me and Jason, we're going to take this all the way through (laughs) tonight and, you know, I just want to say, Courtney, thank you for writing a wonderful book. Um, It's really going to infuriate people. It's going to make them sad. It's going to wake them up. (laughs) It's going to really, um, and also make them swoon. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. A lot of bang for your buck. And I'm the girl. (laughs) And um, no pinball machines. You've got to go to Sarah for that. Listen, that uh, like, as Paul Abdul said, we come together because opposites attract. attract. Um, Beautiful. But I, I'm just really proud of you. Without that sound, I, I hope that doesn't sound condescending. You're just no. great. You're just great <laughs> is you. the point I'm trying to make. And so is everyone who attended. And thank you, Silas. You're great, too. That's all. Oh, wonderful. Everybody's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you to our attendees. And we wish everyone a lovely night.